Marriages or civil partnerships across the spectrum can be a beautiful thing. A time for love, celebrations, food, and capturing moments with friends and family. Oh. But I don't care about any of that. But did you know instead that marriages and civil partnerships can bring several perks and changes to your personal finance? Now, I'm not talking about gifts that you'll receive during the ceremony, but rather looking at the impacts on your taxes, your pension, and any financial allowances. You know, all the fun stuff. So without further ado, let's understand what these financial perks and changes are. I'm Kozan from Financial Madness, helping you be better with your money. Now, before I get into all of these points, I just wanted to say a quick note on the language that I'll be using. What I mention here applies to both marriages and civil partnerships here in the UK, regardless of your gender. So if I happen to accidentally mention a perk in relation to a marriage, for example, please note that it also is applicable for a civil partnership and vice versa. With that cleared up, let's get into it. First up is inheritance tax. So I actually break this down in more detail in my inheritance tax video, which I'll link in now. But as a quick summary, here in the UK, no one pays inheritance tax on the first £325,000 on their estate, which is basically their total assets minus their total liabilities. Any value above this threshold can be subject to the standard inheritance tax rate of 40%, which is quite a hefty bill. However, if you are married or civil partnered, inheritance tax does not apply if you transfer all or part of your estate to your spouse or civil partner. So for example, if you have an estate worth £1 million, even though it is way above the threshold allowance, because the estate goes to your spouse, this won't be subject to any inheritance tax whatsoever. The spouse or civil partner can also inherit any unused inheritance tax allowances from you, which can see their allowance go up to £650,000 when they pass away. On top of this, there is another additional allowance that is given to you if you pass your home to either your children, your stepchildren or your grandchildren and any of their spouses and civil partners. Now this allowance threshold comes to a total of £175,000 and again if any of the allowances is left unused this can also be transferred to your spouse or civil partner. Moving on to the next perk and that is that you are able to freely transfer any assets to your partner without incurring a tax bill. Now this can be really useful when it comes to sharing certain allowances. For example, say you have maxed out your ISA allowance of £20,000 for a certain tax year, but your partner hasn't. You can actually transfer your assets to them and they can use their remaining allowances, thus reducing your tax bill. We can also take this one step further. Say, for example, you have both maxed out your ISA allowances. You have an extra buffer called the capital gains tax allowance. Again, if you have reached your capital gains tax allowance threshold of £12,300 for a particular tax year, but your partner hasn't, you can again transfer your assets to them without incurring a tax bill. The same can also be done for your personal saving allowances too, but to be honest, interest rates are so low that this is hardly ever going to be an issue anyway, regardless of whether you're married or not married. Next up is something called a marriage tax allowance. Now this only applies if one half of the married or civil partnered couple is a basic rate taxpayer, which at the time of this recording is someone earning between 12,571 to 50,270, whilst the other partner is a non-taxpayer and therefore earning up to or less than the personal allowance of 12,570 pounds per year. The non-taxpayer can apply to have 1,260 pounds of their tax-free allowance transferred to the tax-paying partner, therefore reducing the tax bill overall. I know that sounds complicated, so let me demonstrate this with an example. So let's say person A and person B are civil partnered. Person B earns £12,000 per year and person A earns £30,000 per year. Person B doesn't pay any income tax as they earn below the personal allowance threshold of £12,570. Person A does pay income tax on any amount above the threshold and the tax rate is at 20%. This means that out of their salary, 17,430 of it is subject to income tax and they pay a bill of £3,486 in taxes for that particular year. Now, instead, if they use the marriage allowance, person B can transfer £1,260 of their own personal allowance over to person B. Person B's personal allowance will decrease to 11310 so that means that they will then be subject to income tax on any amount above this. So that works out to be £690 
and their tax bill will be £138 for that year. But person B sees their personal allowance increase to 13830 So only £16,170 of their income is now subject to income tax, which comes to a bill of £3,234 per year. When you total it up with the taxes with person B and then compare it to the results in the previous scenario, you can see that they save £114 in taxes per year. Now, how much you save can really depend on how much you both earn. But if my maths stands correct, the most you can save from the scheme is £252 per year. Sticking on the topic of income tax, once you have become a married or civil partnered couple, it's important to note that any joint income you receive will be automatically taxed at a rate of whoever from the couple is the higher taxpayer. So for example, say if one spouse is a higher rate taxpayer and the other is a basic rate taxpayer, and you earn income from a buy to let property that you both own, this income will be charged at a rate of 40% as this is the higher of the two tax rates. However, you do have the option to transfer the property to the sole ownership of the basic rate taxpayer and therefore you'd be charged a lower rate of income tax and therefore potentially saving you lots of money in tax savings. This is one example for buy to let but there are other examples that this could also apply to. Next up is to understand how it impacts your will. So if you had a will before you were married or civil partnered, then this will immediately becomes a void and you'll need to write a new one. If you don't write a new one and you pass away, your entire estate will automatically be left to your spouse, which can be exactly what you're looking for. But if it's not, it can mean that if there are any children in the mix, especially from a different relationship, they will not receive any inheritance. It's also important to look at the flip side of this too. So if you weren't married or civil partnered and you passed away, your partner won't receive anything unless you specify it in your will. There can be added complications if you owned a property together as others may be able to make claims on your share of the property rather than going directly to your partner. So the important lesson learned here is that in any case, married and civil partnered or not, make sure you have a will. So moving on to the state pension now. So if your spouse or civil partner dies, you may be able to inherit some of their state pension. The amount you will receive will vary on a number of factors, such as the, their retirement date, years of national insurance contributions that they made, when you were civil married, when you were civil married, when you were married or civil partnered, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, it is worth noting that you can see an uplift in your state pension if they do pass away, and of course, vice versa. And lastly, still looking at pensions, but moving on to private pensions now. Now, in the event of your death, there is usually a beneficiary to your private pension. And usually in particular with defined benefit pensions, the default beneficiary is your spouse. So if you die, your spouse can inherit part of your private pension. You can easily nominate someone else to get this money. You just have to take extra action to do this. But normally if you haven't done anything, the default will automatically be your spouse or civil partner. But it is worth checking with your provider, especially if you have remarried or re-civil partnered, as older pensions may have an ex-spouse listed as a beneficiary. Of course, that is it for this week's episode. Let me know if any of these tips actually surprised you or you didn't know about. And if I have missed anything, obviously let me know in the comment section down below. And as usual, if you did find this video incredibly useful, I'd appreciate if you smash that like button. That does wonders for the growth of this YouTube channel as it does help the algorithm. And remember, I release a video every single week. So if you wanna keep up to date with those, hit the subscribe button too. See you later, bye.